Welcome back guys to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we've got the brand new Troily Design Stage Enduro Full Face Helmet, those incredible looking Cane Creek titanium cranks, and all the usual stuff from you guys, from Bike Cave to Top Mods and everything in between. Okay, so straight into tech news. And I've just come back from Sea Otter and there was so much kit out there. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen some of those Sea Otter videos we've been making. So if you haven't, please go and check those out. There's some on the GMBN main channel and of course here on the tech channel. But the thing that jumped out at me at Sea Otter unexpectedly was seeing that brand new Troily Design Stage Endura helmet. Now it's got that sort of telltale Troily styling. It looks very similar to the D3 at a glance. When you pick this thing up, it weighs about 750 grams. It's so light and it's designed specifically for enduro racing and e-bike riding. So this is not a replacement for a downhill helmet. It is not a replacement for anything to be used in slope style. You will not see people like Brandon Semenuk using this helmet for doing tricks and stuff. It is focused as a lightweight, breathable helmet for all day riding basically in the saddle. Now, unlike some of the other helmets out there of this sort of style, it's not got a removable jaw guard. So it's a similar style concept to the Fox Pro Frame, which is also a ventilated enduro style helmet. Although I've got to say, personally speaking, I thought the Troy Lee just had the edge visually. It's got a slightly sleeker look and it looks really similar to, like I said earlier, the D3 helmet. Now at the moment, we don't know when it's going to be released. We don't know a price on it either. So you're going to have to wait for that one, I'm afraid, but we do know it's going to be released after Crankworks this year, so very soon. So keep an eye out for that one. Orange Mountain Bikes are from the UK, and they're well known as being a born and bred sort of brand. Of course, Steve Pete made them very famous back in the day when he raced them for many years. Now, Orange Bikes have actually been around for nearly 30 years now, and they're celebrating that this year with a new bike called the Formula Series. So it's based on their existing Alpine 6 and 5 ranges, but they're doing Formula models of these bikes. Now, way back in time, they made a bike called the Formula, and Formula was a specific bike for the race team. It wasn't available to the public. It was super light. Check it out on screen. Actually, it's quite a cool retro picture here. And it's a super light cross-country race bike, basically, back in the day. The consumers couldn't buy it and it was kitted out with the best of the best at the time. This is essentially what they're offering now, the Formula Package, which comes on the 5 and the Alpine 6. Now these bikes come in a specific black finish with polished graphics and it's a really, really high end, nice look. Orange bikes have always been that kind of bold and leery and now they've gone down the stealth route and I think these things look really, really cool. Now, something I particularly like on them is they have the Cane Creek double barrel air shock on there and the Helm forks up front. Now that Helm fork is something special. It's a really, really good tunable fork. And seeing the spec on these bikes is amazing. They've got race face carbon wheels, SRAM 12 speed, Shimano brakes. They've got like the best of the best on there basically. So have a look at these things. Really, really nice images as well. As you might expect, bikes of this caliber are not cheap. And these top flight spec orange bikes retail from 6,800 and 6,900 pounds respectively for the two different models there. So check out the Orange Bikes website, it's got all the details on there and loads more really nice shots. Patagonia, the outdoor clothing brand, are now making technical mountain bike clothing. Granted, this isn't tech in the way of, you know, new derailleurs and stuff like that, but the technical clothing thing is something that we all like to ride in and like to use. And Patagonia as a company is someone, I think they're really an aspirational as a company because of the fact that they're, they're quite earth friendly, they put a lot back into the planet, and they're quite into longevity of the stuff as well. So when you buy Patagonia clothing, you can send it back for repairs when things like the zips might break or if you have a crash and tear a hole. They want you to keep that garment for as long as possible and they will always be there to help you. A really good company to buy into. If you have a look on the screen now, they've got a few really cool products. So there's the, the Houdini, which is an ultralight packable jacket. Comes in loads of colors. It's basically, it's near enough water resistant. It's windproof and you can stuff this in your back pocket. It's absolutely tiny. Comes in all the usual sort of colors and quite a cool camo color. Check that one out, that's cool. They've also got the Storm Racer, which is their three layer, fully waterproof and windproof jacket. It's made from nylon ripstop material. It's designed to be durable and tough, not just like a minimal shell. This is like a real serious jacket. They also have the Nine Trails Hydration Backpack, which is a two liter size bladder inside there that comes supplied with it. It's made from toughened Cordura. So again, it's just a bit of a hint from Patagonia. It's designed to last. 
I love what Patagonia are doing, and it's really cool to see them coming into the mountain bike technical clothing world. So have a look at their site, they've got some really good stuff on there. And another bit of snooping around has led me to realize that Zip, the famous wheel company, are coming into mountain biking. So this could be quite exciting because Zip are super high end, they're really, really good wheels, and they're no doubt gonna be carbon, and they're gonna have a few tricks up their sleeve too. Now if you look on Jerome Clement's Instagram right now on screen, look what he's talking about in there. He's talking about riding wheels, and we know that there's a Zip relationship going on. Zip won't actually comment on it, but we also noticed that Mitch Ropolato is also appears to be running a set of wheels that appear to be Zip. So we should have some more info on this. We're busy sort of poking them with a the stick. So the guys at Zip will tell us more anytime now, hopefully. Propane bikes have got a brand new 29 inch wheel trail bike with 130 mil travel called the Hugene. Now it's available in two specs with a 140 or a 150 mil fork. It's got their tried and tested Pro 10 suspension platform on there. And this thing looks really, really nice. So look at these studio shots that they sent us on the screen now. It's got that really nice low slung sort of weighted design. It looks really, really quite good. It's special blend, high end carbon fiber construction. And there are three models available in it. The start, the best seller, and the high end. Now the suspension design is quite interesting. It's got quite high anti-squat values. There's a little chart here that just shows you that anti-squat. And that, what that essentially means is as you're pedaling, it's actually wanting to extend slightly. So it really sits up on those really aggressively steep climbs. So it's definitely gonna be a bit of a winch on those really nasty climbs. And something I particularly like on it is it's got these dirt shield bearing covers all over it to keep out the crap. So this is a really smart thing to do because of course bearings work great until they're basically penetrated by muck and water and sand and all the stuff that gets ingested into them. You keep that stuff out, they're gonna keep on chugging for a long time. Now, White, another a British brand, actually have been doing this for many years. So I'm, I'm surprised it's taken other companies so long to adopt this similar system. So big ups basically to Propane for doing it. It's a really, really nice looking bike and it's a very reasonable price package too. And finally in the news, you might have noticed that the uh, the first round of the World Cup was won by a certain Mr. Gwyn on a brand new version of the Whitey Chewers downhill bike. Now at a glance, it's kind of similar to the previous bike. You look a bit closer though, and there are a few differences. So out back, it's still got that four bar system they use, but there's a slightly different linkage in there driving that shock. Now the front end as well shares some similarities with their newly relaunched Capra bike. It's kind of an amalgamation of the two. I, I think this thing looks really, really good. Now, something that pleases me immensely about it is available in five sizes now. So the reach values on this, they're available from 410 up to 495. So, you know, you're effectively buying this bike by length. And that is a really smart thing to do because some people want to size up, some people want a shorter bike. So to have five sizes available on a downhill bike is really something quite special. I think that's a really smart choice. As always, there's a lot of good value options there. There's two carbon fiber models, there's an alloy model, and there's a carbon fiber frame set. Go and have a look at the YT website. The site is absolutely killer at the moment as well. It's probably one of the coolest ones right now. Uh, and if you haven't already seen it, you may as well watch the goat video while you're there. It's pretty good. Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. This is where you guys get to send in the places you keep your bikes and you work on your bikes. It could be the back of a car, could be an office, it could be a shed, it could be a front room. Wherever it is, don't care. Send them in, we love seeing this stuff. So first up this week is from Harry in Devon. He's 13 years old. Let's have a look at your gaff, Harry. Hey, no, nice. that? that's like a barn or something. No smoking, switch off engine. Yes, I love all the sort of retro signs and stuff in there. Hey, it's not bad effort, Harry. I reckon you got a pretty good thing going on in there. You could definitely turn this into a bit of a deluxe bike cave over time, I reckon. What have you got on the bench here? I can't see, is that some sort of grinder? So you've got a giant, is that a trance? Looks like a trance, you've got specialized too. Nice, got a good little selection of stuff. Pair of new proof pedals up on there. Some Shimano spare parts. Nice work, Harry, good work. 13 year old with a barn, I haven't seen that before. Next up is from Philippe Ferrier. Hey, GMBN Tech and Dolly, my name's Philippe. I live in Portugal and here's my entry for Bike Cave. I had this space underneath the entry stairs of my house and I have to use the bikes on the ground with some stands. One day I looked at a concrete wall and had the idea of putting up this OSB board. Now I have a lot more space and in the winter days I have my roller train and a laptop where I do some Zwifting. On the other end I have an Ikea board with some cabinets and more OSB board to put tools on display. Oh man, I'll tell you what, this is looking real good, Philippe. I am actually super impressed with the space you've got in here. Loads of race numbers on the wall, that's really cool. Yeah, you've got your turbo trainer set up, you've got your, yeah, more OSB in the back there with your tools. Martin would definitely be pleased with your 90 degree 
tool sort of storage thing going on there. Nice, this is a good effort, mate. Well into that. Thanks for sending that one in, Philippe. Next up is from Brandalorn. I know this might not be a typical bike cave, as it's in fact my local bike shop. I wanted to send you the photos as they've recently upgraded and it's one of the most beautiful bike shops I've ever been to. These guys are so good and have continued to keep me in the sport by offering affordable advice and honest service. Can't think of a more trustworthy place. Well, that's a really glowing review of the place. They're located in Montgomery, VT USA and a true local business. I love all the GMBN content and really look forward to the tech show to give me more confidence to work on my own bike. P.S. They also have a full juice, coffee and organic health food bar on site. It truly is the perfect place to hang out. I know Martin would love it. Wow, it looks kind of like a, it looks more like a gallery in there. Is that a fireman's pole running down the middle? You could probably use it as one. I can't imagine they'd be too happy about that though. No, seriously, it's really nice. I love the kids' bikes hanging up at the back there. Big variety of stuff. Oh yeah, I see it looks a bit like a diner downstairs. Maybe it was an old bar or something at one point. Really cool, I love all the wood and stuff in there. Really well stocked as well. Loads of good clothing, loads of sort of plaid shirts and camel backs and everything on the back wall there. Oh man, it looks really cool. The J Cloud Cyclery. Yeah, well I'll definitely look it up. If I'm ever in town, I'll definitely be popping in there for a drink. Looks like a wicked bike shop. Hey, I'm really pleased that you say that the bike shop is like such a, an important thing for you. Because I really genuinely think bike shops are important to everyone. Even if you just go and hang out with the guys at a bike shop and buy a few things here and there, it's really good to support those local bike shops because they do offer a lot to the cycling community. We've got many shops around here. They, do, they offer group rides in the evenings and events where you can learn to sort of work on your bikes. It's well worth going to your local bike shop to find out that sort of stuff. And if any of you guys have got a really cool local bike shop that you want to see in bike cave take some pictures of it and send them in it doesn't just have to be your place it's anywhere that bikes are kept and worked on remember so it could be a pro's place too the email address is on the screen right there don't forget to use the hashtag bike cave in your subject header there because we're getting a hell of a lot of email from all of you basically we're getting so many that it's kind of becoming hard to filter through them so if you use those hashtags it's a lot easier and it's more likely to get on next week's show Now it's time for Rewind. This is our retro corner of the show where we look at retro products, tell you where they've come from, where they're going, look at some new tech and tell you how it evolved from what it was. And you guys are even sending in so many retro bikes and retro bits yourself. So we feature it all, whatever it is. So first up this week is from Jerry Kazai. After watching the Sea Otter Weird Tech video with the retro light speed, ah uh, yeah, that was, that was a really cool find, just to chat to that guy. Um, it reminded me I had an old RockShox Judy FSX, I remember those. Um, be a great piece for GMBN Rewind. I bought it second hand and it came with a shock bone carbon arch and tie hardware. I don't remember that. Um, unfortunately I no longer have the original CNC cantilever arch. I added wiper seals and the England total air cartridges to replace the elastomers. Always wanted to do a retro build with a fork, but the CNC dropouts are known to crack and I wouldn't want to risk damaging it. Oh, I'll tell you what, this gives me a particular memory looking at these forks. So, as far as I remember, they you could adjust the travel on them. They sat somewhere between the Judy and the Judy SL, but you could adjust them up to 75mm travel, I think. So 50, 60 and 75, I'm going to say. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's about right. The carbon arch was really trick, although I do remember now you say it, that CNC arch, I think it had holes in it all the way around, didn't it? The early ones. See, my memory of that fork was the Brit Jason McCroy riding them on his specialised FSR. So arguably he was one of the first British racers to get a real big time contract. And to say he influenced riding in the UK is a quite you know, a bit of an understatement. The guy was absolutely incredible. And unfortunately he's no longer with us. He was killed in an RTA, so um, it's a real shame, but what Jason stood for and still stands for really is getting young people into mountain biking and people still sort of really aspire to do what he did. Uh, have a look at this clip of Jason on the screen now, absolutely smashing it on his old FSR. This was when that bike first came out and I remember at the time watching this clip, it was filmed by Pete Tompkins who used to make the crud catchers, in fact still does make crud catchers. Look how active the bike is. Bear in mind, at the time, everyone was riding hardtails and a few suspension bikes that were out there weren't that good. And that FSR, you could see the back end tracking, you can see that custom RockShox fork on the front there, which they were basically exclusive to specialise those forks, although you could buy them aftermarket, like, like the one you've got. Lovely bit of kit, really nice, and really good picture as well, by the way. Nice, thank you for sending that one in, Jerry. Really good to see that. 
Now, I want to bring something to the table here this week because I had a really, really cool trip to Sea Otter recently. So that's a big international show. There's lots of cool stuff there. But just before the show, Neil and myself, we flew into San Francisco, then we drove up to Fairfax in Marin County. And of course, Marin County is really where the roots of this sport started. Now we went to the museum there and we were lucky enough to chat firsthand with Joe Breeze and Charlie Kelly, who were two of those founding fathers. And then the next day, we went to see Gary Fisher at his house and we've got some really cool content coming on the story of mountain biking. So you're gonna have to keep an eye out for that, but it's a big project. So our editors are working on that at the moment. But when we were at the museum, I was lucky enough to buy from Charlie Kelly a couple of the early Fat Tire Flyer magazines. Now, look on screen now and you'll just see uh, how cool some of this old stuff is. So this one's dated July, August 1982. Now this magazine was mostly put together by Charlie Kelly and it just documents the early mountain bike movement. There's just so much cool stuff in here. You've got Richie mountain bikes. It's got the date in here. There's just everything you can imagine like, from those retro days. Adverts for the dropper post, Trailmaster bikes, it's just fascinating to see all this stuff. And you should definitely give those guys a follow on Instagram. Their Instagram tag handle is on the description below this video. So click through and have a look at that. But when we went to visit Gary Fisher, he gave myself and Neil a very unique present, a reprint of his original 1981 catalog. So the very first Fisher Bikes catalog. Now these things are just amazing. So in those days, it was Charlie Kelly and it was Gary Fisher that put the idea of building mountain bikes together. It was Tom Ritchie that actually rode them. Now this has got a load of history in here and you're gonna see a lot more of this stuff coming up in the video, but it's so cool to see it. You've got all the spec on the bikes, all the stuff about Tom Ritchie. It's, it's just quite mind blowing, the, the level that's in here. Talking about every specific thing that's on there, TA cranks, TA bottle cage, MKS pedals, height rights, Suntour derailleurs, one piece handlebars, Campinola and Cinelli stuff. It's all in here. Magura brake levers, check that out. Really cool to see all this sort of retro stuff. So definitely give the museum, the Marin Museum of Bicycling a follow on Instagram and check out their stuff. And if you're ever in the States or ever near San Francisco, pay them a visit. It's a really, really cool museum and they do an excellent tour. Yes, time for top mods. This is where you guys get to send in anything that you've been modifying to your bike. Could be some handlebar grips, could be some tires, could be a service, could be a fork tune. Anything you've done, doesn't matter how big or how small it is, we wanna hear about it because tinkering with your bikes is fun and it makes them better. So first up this week is from Mike Burwood. I thought I'd share to you my recent and somewhat labor intensive mod. As you can see from the first pick, I had a horrible nest to deal with at the front of my drive. Yeah, I've had a lot of bikes. I've got snakes weddings up front. Really horrible having all those cables. Having watched a bunch of GMBN how-to videos, I finally plucked up the courage to dismantle the lot and reroute all my cables sensibly. It took a while as I ended up replacing the MET cable, the shapeshifter cable, shortening and bleeding both the rear brake and the dropper hose and a complete rebuild of my rear brake lever as the plunger got stuck for some reason. Once rerouted, I was able to apply some heat shrink and tame the nest into two tidy cable runs. As you can see, it was totally worth it. OCD heaven, loads quieter too. Yeah, I mean, looks aside, that is one of the major benefits of doing that. It does totally quieten your bike down. Oh mate, that looks really good. That's one of the best ones I've seen, to be honest. Quite heavy duty, they, they look big, but obviously so much nicer than having that just snake's wedding of stuff going on at the front of your bike. I can't stand the clutter, even though I love the technology that has to have that clutter. I wonder if we're gonna have like wireless everything at some point. It might be a bit odd. What do you reckon, wireless brakes? Is that ever gonna happen? Terrify me if they do, I think. Next up is from Stephen Guy. How about this then? My 2016 Rocky Mountain Altitude uh, 730. Nice bike, but it wasn't quite right. So I changed a few things. So I put some ODI Ruffian lock-on grips on there, ODI flight control series handlebars, flight control wing tips to extend the bars by 12.5 mil. I forget they exist actually, that's quite a good idea. So it's a set of handlebars, basically got threaded inserts in the end and you can actually extend them or you can make them narrower, uh, depending on your preference or perhaps even on the race course or the place you're riding at. Some places when it's technical, you might wanna have the bars a little bit narrower, perhaps. I think it's cool. So you put a dropper post on there, nuke proof saddle on there too and DMR V twin pedals. But that still wasn't enough. Then you saw 
my new mega so this is my new um, as in my new mega so he's painted the bike himself and done new de decals paint job was done in the basement i'll tell you what you're a brave man painting a rocky mountain because that's like it was a really nice bike anyway there's the original picture on screen nothing wrong with that in my eyes that's a smart looking bike very color coordinated as well but i'll tell you what you've done a really good job on that it actually looks like it could be a production bike i'm genuinely really impressed with that it must have taken some serious hours to get a good finish on it like that but yeah i would be terrified taking paint anywhere near my bikes to be honest good work like i'm impressed with that is anyone else out there spray the bike themselves if you have send it in let's have a look now tech of the week this week is something i saw at sea otter on the last morning i was there just before going to watch the slalom in fact and there's a set of cranks from cane creek that I just can't stop thinking about, so I just want to show you guys because they're just stunning. So they're called the EE wings. They are titanium cranks. They are just staggeringly beautiful when you see these in the flesh. So they weigh 400 grams. So granted, you, you can get some carbon cranks out there. They're gonna be similar sort of weight, but these are 20 to 30% stiffer and they're gonna be a lot stronger and more durable as well. As you know, carbon is very strong, but it is prone to cracking and other sort of damage that might occur specifically on a crank from rock striking and bashing your cranks on the ground. It could weaken those cranks in time, whereas titanium cranks, really, they're gonna laugh that off. It's never gonna corrode because it, you just don't get any rust on titanium. And something that's quite mind-blowing about them, they've got a 10-year warranty on them. So that's quite a claim from those guys to offer that warranty, but for good reason actually, because they cost a whacking $999 for a set of them. But offset that with a 10 year warranty, titanium cranks, it could be the last set of cranks you ever need to buy. They're compatible with X-Sync chain rings, so the SRAM style chain rings on there, and there's a BB30, well it's a 30 must spindle, so they can take BB30, Pressfit 92, Pressfit 89.5, and press fit 30s and 392 Evo bottom brackets on them. But I, I'm just so into this. And look at the join on here. So that's like a hearth joint where the axle actually sort of joins into itself. It's got 30 serrated teeth. The machining on it is just unbelievably nice. I tell you, those guys at Cane Creek, they've always made nice stuff, but I did not see that crank coming. And I think it's one of the nicest set of cranks I've ever seen. I would love to have set those on a bike. Those things are Okay, so now it's just time for a little update on bike build. There are a lot of parts coming from around the world being sent to us, and obviously taking the time getting here, they have to come for customs and that sort of stuff. So fortunately, the first thing has turned up, and this is it. So this is, when we get them out, a set of DMR axe cranks. Now DMR is a British company, but the reason I wanted to spec the cranks on there is the fact the Scott Velo Solutions downhill team, including Brenda Fairclough, of course, are using these on their bikes. They're incredibly strong, really stiff, and I think they're really, really nice looking. Um, these ones have a Praxis Works chaining on it, but it's not the right chaining, so I'm actually gonna have to change that out to make it work with a boost, basically, on the back end. That's a standard sort of chaining on there. That's a 34, so I think I'm gonna get a 34 on there again, because that would kind of suit me. In fact, actually, what do you guys think? 34 or 32 because I've got the E13 cassette coming over from America at the moment. So that's a 946 tooth sprocket on the back. So do I go for the 32 or the 34? I'm inclined to say the 34, you get a bit more clearance to the chain from the uh, chain to the chain stay for a little less chain slap. Um, I don't mind pushing a slightly bigger gear and I think that cassette is enough to run one of those on. Um, and any ideas on the chain ring would be good. I mean, the Praxis stuff, I really like. Praxis, if you didn't know, they make pretty much all of the OEM cranks for e-bikes out there. And they make a lot of really trick stuff you'll see on other people's bikes without realizing it's Praxis. Um, DMR, of course, do chain rings. I mean, there's a number out there, but I do quite like the idea of Praxis, actually. I didn't realize the DMR cranks had Praxis stuff on them. But first bit is here, it's good. And I've been told there is a fork in the post at the moment. That is that X-Fusion fork, so we're going for that. And I'm gonna see how it feels initially when we get the fork slung into the front of the frame. But I'm thinking about getting the shocks front and rear custom tuned on it. So it's gonna be like give a bit of a special ride. But I think it's gonna be a really nice bike already. So the fork, I've got a feeling it's the all black new one. So that will look pretty mean on there. Need to figure out a seat post in the stem next, I think. So 
Give me some ideas for stems you'd like to see on the bike. Nothing too wild, it's got to be something that's strong and stiff. It could be something simple like a race face or an Eastern or a Renthal perhaps. Even Lickproof, they do nice like quality stems now. So I'm not fussed what, we will go for something around 40 millimeters long I reckon on this. It feels like about right, it's a size large frame in case you're wondering. So yeah, give us some suggestions for stem, we'll start looking at that. and. Hopefully by next show, you're gonna have the fork ready to put in there. And I'll have decided on the chainring too. So there we go, there's another GMBN Tech weekly show in the bag. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Let us know in the comments anything you loved, anything you'd like to see more of, any stuff, requests for rewind, all of that stuff in those comments below. And of course, the email address, hit us up with all your entries for Bike K, for Top Mods, for Rewind. Love getting that stuff from you guys. So a couple other really cool videos to check out of five disc brake hacks, they're all set up hacks, a couple of useful little things in there, especially if you've got the pistons that have pushed their way out, a little hack to get around that, it's quite a good one that. And click up here if you wanna see the sort of the latest and the greatest stuff I found at Sea Otter. That's the one that went out on Saturday, just over the weekend, so really cool video that one. And of course, as always, click on that globe to subscribe, share it around, tell your mates about us, and if you liked the show, give us a thumbs up,